Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, talk as part of Oxford uh, Green Week. Welcome to the Oxford Martin School. Uh, we're very lucky um, to have today um, two speakers on protecting the high seas. Particularly lucky to have Alex Rogers on dry land because that's not so common. Um, Alex is the science director for Rev Ocean. He's also um, was a founding director of the Sustainable Oceans Programme here at the Oxford Martin School and um, is a visiting professor at the Department of Zoology here. Um, he's internationally recognised for his expertise in deep sea ecology and human impacts on the oceans and has worked extensively with governmental, intergovernmental and non-governmental organisations from Greenpeace to the UN International Seabed Authority. Um, he's just published um, a new book um, which is over in Blackwells in some numbers apparently, um, called The Deep, The Hidden Wonders of Our Oceans and How We Can Protect Them. And Alex um, is um, he's also worked as a consultant on the BBC series Blue Planet and has been down, he was telling me, to over 3,000 metres in the submarines. So um, we will hear from Alex for about 40 minutes. We are, and he will talk to us about an, how to, uh, what a network of marine protected areas in the high seas might look like and then we're going to hear for about 10 to 15 minutes from Gwilym, Gwilym Rowlands, who is an expert on how we might enforce such an area of uh, protected areas on the high seas, because Gwilym is an expert on Earth observation data and satellite imagery, uh, also part of the Oxford Martin Programme on Sustainable Oceans. So, and after both have spoken, they'll come back up here and we'll have plenty of time for questions um, so, if you could save your questions for the end, um, and now I'll hand over to Alex. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, thanks everyone for coming today. I'm going to talk to you about uh, the high seas, and um, particular thanks for making it in the dreadful weather uh, at the moment. You probably feel like you've walked through an ocean to get here. Um, so, uh, I thought I'd just start by talking about what the high seas actually are and essentially it's the waters beyond 200 nautical miles from the coastal baseline so it's outside of the control of any single state in terms of use of resources and just to complicate matters in legal terms the water column is actually treated differently to the seabed so the water column is termed the high seas whereas the seabed is termed as the area and uh, the reason for that differentiation will become clear a little later in the talk. So all of the pale blue area you can see here on this map is uh, what we call the high seas or areas beyond national jurisdiction. So the coloured bits on this map are the exclusive economic zones of states, at least the coloured bits that are uh, over water. Um, and uh, it's a huge ecosystem, uh, it covers about 60% of the ocean area and nearly three quarters of the ocean's volume. So it's pretty much the biggest ecosystem on Earth. So where did this concept of the high seas actually come from? Well, you might be surprised to hear that it actually came as, uh, from a justification for an act of piracy. Um, and this was during the war between uh, the Portuguese and the Dutch, and uh, the um, Dutch actually seized a Portuguese vessel uh, and justified it through uh, this concept of mare liberum, freedom of the seas. Um, and there have been various arguments as to uh, you know, whether this is a good thing or not through the ages, but this has led to some rather strange historic uh, artifacts in terms of our uh, zoning of the ocean. So, uh, for example, if I just flip back here um, to the uh, area which is conceived as state territory, three nautical miles from the coast, that was the distance over which you could fire a cannon from the shore and defend uh, your waters. So, um, really, um, my story, I guess, starts with the first modern oceanographic expedition, that of HMS Challenger, in 1872 to 1876. And the Challenger was uh, uh, the first real modern 
oceanographic uh, expedition. It sampled geology, biology, physical oceanography, and the ship pretty much went all around the world. Uh, apart from the Indian Ocean, which you'll notice it managed to completely steer around, um, the historical consequences of which we're still suffering from today, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. Since Challenger, we've learned a lot about the oceans. We know something about what the seafloor actually looks like. It's not completely flat. It's uh, got chains of mountains. There are canyons, uh, ocean trenches. So really quite a varied uh, topography. But it's quite interesting that we've only actually accurately mapped something like 10 to 20 percent of the seafloor. Um, so a lot of what you see here are best guesstimates some of which are based on old soundings back from uh, the 18th century or even further in, in the past. And this first picture of uh, the ocean floor really was put together by Bruce Heason and Mary Tharp, working on very primitive echo soundings uh, post the uh, Second World War. And Mary Tharp literally drew uh, what she thought the, the bottom of the ocean looked like from uh, these echo soundings. Although we, we now know much more about the ocean, there's an awful lot we don't know. Uh, and this is just one example. Um, you see here it's estimated that there are about 2 million uh, species in the ocean, of which we've described about 200,000. So 90% of life in the ocean is undescribed, and most of that hasn't been seen really by humankind. And uh, if you look at the distribution of records of species in the ocean, and this uh, diagram kind of shows a, a graphic representation of that. So the warm colours here are uh, where there are lots of species records and the cold colours where there's very few. What you see is as you move away from the land and deeper into the ocean, then we know less and less in terms of what's out there. And that also extends to ecosystems as well. And in fact, the deep water pelagic, which is the water column between the surface and the seabed, is the least explored ecosystem probably on Earth. We've only investigated about 0.0001% of that particular ecosystem. Sea mounts, which I'll talk to you in a minute about, uh, we've investigated about 0.002% of sea mounts or underwater mountains. And these are very important habitats in the ocean as they're biological hotspots. So um, what we do know and what we have learned about the ocean is that it produces a, a huge range of ecosystem services for us. And these are from very simple things, simple to understand, such as the provisioning of fish for people to eat, and the ocean is still extremely important in terms of food security, uh, particularly in terms of protein and supply of nutrients, um, but also more complex processes such as nutrient uh, cycling, for example, the carbon cycle, and the production of oxygen. So something like one out of every two breaths you take in this room has actually come from marine phytoplankton in the oceans. And WWF recently uh, estimated that the goods and services provided by the ocean are worth somewhere in the region of $2.5 trillion per annum, which makes it the seventh biggest economy on the planet. But of course, the planet simply couldn't, um, uh, couldn't operate without many of these processes going on. So in fact, uh, the ocean really is infinitely valuable in terms of supporting processes uh, that make the plan planet livable uh, for us. So what does much of the sea floor of the high seas look like? Well, much of it looks like this, fairly flat uh, sediment. Um, there's life throughout the entire depth range of the ocean, all the way down to nearly 11,000 metres in the Marianas Trench. Um, that life is adapted to low pressure, to very small amounts of food uh, and also low temperatures. And it's a very diverse fauna. One of the things we've learned since the 1960s is that uh, diversity in the deep ocean is actually very high. Um, the abundance and biomass 
of animal life declines as you go deeper, and this is because the supply of food decreases as you move away from the surface. Size generally declines unless you're a scavenger, in which case uh, you actually get bigger as you go deeper. Um, but most of the diversity is actually in the small critters that live in the sediments or on them. And they're animals like this. So they're things like uh, polychaete worms, uh, crustaceans, and bivalve mollusks. Um, and the worms, in fact, are the most diverse group, certainly down to about half a millimetre in size. And the diversity of these animals is very, very high, in fact, surprisingly uh, high. We are starting to get an idea of how this diversity is distributed horizontally, if you like, uh, through the uh, oceans on the sea floor. And what it seems, uh, or the pattern seems to be, one of the highest diversity at mid-latitudes. And we think that's because that's where the highest supply of organic food is falling out from the ocean surface. And this is a contrast with shallow water marine life, which shows its highest diversity in the tropics, in the equatorial regions. The patterns of diversity with depth are also very interesting. We see a peak in diversity at mid-slope depths, somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 metres. So um, diversity, certainly in these sediments, seems to actually increase as you go down deeper into the ocean um, before it starts to decrease as a result of lack of food. We're not absolutely certain about why this is, but it probably has something to do with interactions between species and the supply of food. But the uh, deep ocean, the high seas, don't all look like that. And in fact, there are some really remarkable uh, habitats which occupy a smaller area of the seabed, and this is one of them. These are deep sea hydrothermal vents. These particular ones uh, we filmed in the Southern Ocean back in, I think it was 2010, uh, at a depth of about 2,500 metres. And the black clouds of fluid you can see there coming out these chimneys are at about 386 degrees C. And these are very, very interesting ecosystems because despite their depth, and as you can see from this photograph here, uh, they have abundant life around them. So what are hydrothermal vents? They're places where seawater penetrates the ocean crust and comes into contact with extremely hot rock around a magma chamber underneath the uh, uh, seabed. There's a very complex exchange of chemicals between the seawater and the rock, and the seawater becomes really enriched in chemicals like hydrogen sulfide and various metal sulfides and so on. And it's these reduced chemicals which are the key to the abundance of life around these vents. Because what's happening here is that bacteria are actually oxidizing some of these chemicals to release energy. So this is an ecosystem which is based on chemosynthesis rather than light energy and photosynthesis. And this was really a remarkable discovery back in 1977 when it was made. But it was remarkable for another reason as well, because it showed us that we could get life in very different conditions to those which we'd previously considered. Um, and in fact now, uh, we've got evidence of hydrothermalism elsewhere in the solar system. Uh, this is a photograph of Enceladus, and you can see jetting off the bottom half of the um, uh, moon there, uh, these geysers of water. And they're actually coming from the subsurface ocean on that moon. And passing satellites have picked up the chemical signature of hydrothermal vents uh, actually in Enceladus. So now there is a possibility of a second genesis of life uh, in the solar system because it's thought that vents are one of the prime candidates for uh, where life originated on Earth. We've done quite a bit of work on hydrothermal vent uh, uh, organisms over the past uh, 10 years. Um, one of the things that was discovered after uh, the 1970s was that the biota around these vents differs depending on where you are in the ocean. So the eastern Pacific, the fauna is uh, characterised by these giant tube worms, these animals which are up to two metres 
uh, tall, they don't have a gut, they don't have a mouth, but they have uh, symbiotic bacteria inside them that oxidize uh, these sulfides. Um, also zoarsid fish, various other worms and mussels and so on. The Western Pacific uh, is different. It's characterized by having these snails with symbiotic bacteria, stalk barnacles and so on. Uh, the Atlantic is really different. It's characterized by these huge swarms of shrimps around the vents and they carry their symbiotic bacteria on their appendages and in their gills. The Indian Ocean, though, is very interesting because it is a kind of mix of the biotas of the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean. So we have vent shrimp, but we also have uh, things like mussels and some of the crabs you'd associate with the Pacific, and also some rather strange local animals like a scaly foot snail, which you can see in the photograph here. These animals are the only animals which secrete iron armor to protect them from the environment and from predators. So we wanted to understand why uh, we were seeing these biogeographic connections between these uh, very different vent faunas. And um, one obvious answer was that there was dispersal through the Southern Ocean, as the Southern Ocean connects all of these other oceans down the Southern Hemisphere. So we went down to look for these vents, um, and we found them around places along uh, a ridge called the East Scotia Ridge, uh, which is just to the um, south, uh, southeast of, um, of South Georgia, as you can see from this map here. And in places where that ridge was swollen up, and it swells up because of a magma chamber actually under the ridge, we found uh, hydrothermal vents. And this was really remarkable because people actually told us that we'd never do this work. And the reason was quite simple. The Southern Ocean really is quite a ferocious place to go and work. Uh, this particular storm uh, I took a photograph of off the South Sandwich Islands. The swells were about 15 metres in uh, height. So you can imagine that's probably as tall as this building uh, pretty much. Um, but we were actually quite lucky. That was probably the only really ferocious storm uh, we came across. And this is what we actually discovered. In fact, what we discovered was something totally unexpected and which bore little resemblance to any of the faunas we'd seen elsewhere. Uh, what you can see on this video are what are called yeti crabs. And they're called yeti crabs because you'll see they have kind of furry bellies. You can just see the fuzz around the sides of these animals, and they actually grow uh, sulfur bacteria on that fuzz and just comb it off and eat it. Um, as you can see, they're rather successful at doing this around these vents, and they occur in absolutely vast numbers. And these were a new species. There was only one other yeti crab known at the time. We also found various other new species. So these snails, which were about so big, um, uh, have symbiotic bacteria actually in a gland in the foot. Uh, they were a new species, a new genus, and a new species of stork barnacle, which was somewhat related to the Pacific animals, but uh, certainly not uh, identical to them. And you'll also see the baby yeti crabs hiding out in these uh, barnacles. But what was really odd were the things that were missing. We found none of the giant tube worms, none of the mussels, no crabs, no shrimp. And it seems that the very, very cold waters of the Antarctic basically keep out animals with certain types of life histories. And that's probably because the extreme seasonality of that system really counts against you if you've got a larva which actually feeds in the plankton. This single four-week uh, expedition basically changed our ideas about the distribution of the fauna around hydrothermal vents globally. So these different colors on this map represent the different types of fauna uh, that, you, um, that you actually find around these vents. So moving from vents, which are a, a kind of biological hotspot in the uh, high seas to another biological hotspot, and that is sea mounts. Uh, this is our own sea mount, which is actually in the UK EEZ, just to the west of Scotland the Anton Dorn Seamount. The summit of that is probably in the region of 200 to 400 metres uh, depth. We actually visited that in 2016. 
Um, and sea mounts are very important because they're kind of oases out in the high seas. So they're very important for predators, foraging, things like tuna sharks, whales, turtles, seals, and seabirds all home in on sea mounts as places where they can forage uh, for rich supplies of food. There are actually a lot of sea mounts in the ocean. This is from a satellite gravity map uh, we did for uh, sea mounts in the ocean back in 2011. And you'll see here over 33,000 large sea mounts across the ocean, covering about 5% of the sea floor. So this is actually a major ecosystem. And I mentioned the Indian Ocean before as being a place which Challenger avoided. Well, it seems that many other scientists have avoided it as well, because it's still one of the most poorly explored parts of the oceans. And uh, back in uh, the, um, I think it was 2010, 2011 again, uh, we actually visited the sea mounts down in uh, the southern Indian Ocean. Um, and this is what we found. Again, very, very rich ecosystems. You'll see the summit of this seamount is covered in corals and all sorts of other sessile uh, organ organisms. There are also these large carnivorous fish swimming around the summit. This is a wreckfish along with a, a shark you can see here in the background. Those wreckfish grow to well over a metre long. Uh, they're really quite voracious predators. There's also clouds of uh, more wongs in the background there as well. This is at a depth of about 200 metres from the summit of the seamount. Deeper still, there were still large predators. This is about 1,000 metres down, and you see here a blunt-nosed six-gilled shark, which are actually probably the, one of the biggest predators we get at these depths around seamounts. And they always come up and investigate uh, our robots while they're, they're down in places like this. We also found some really spectacular other communities. This is a deep water coral reef at a depth of about 1,000 metres. And this has a very high diversity of other organisms associated with it. And in fact, um, we found many, many new taxa uh, on this expedition. Here's a couple, a uh, carnivorous sponge and a sea spider, both of which the taxonomist generously named after me. Um, I don't know whether that was an honour or some sort of veiled uh, uh, insult, but uh, I'll leave that up to you to think about. Um, but uh, we really found this very uh, high instance of undescribed species. Uh, and bearing in mind, most of our work was just focused on the larger animals around these seamounts. So why should we really care about the high seas and about life in the high seas? Well, simply put, the high seas are highly connected to coastal waters. The ocean effectively functions as a single whole. And what you see here are the distributions of various large marine animals throughout the year in uh, the Pacific and Indian Oceans. And you can see that those animals cross from the high seas into coastal waters and back out again. And in fact, um, uh, there was a study done uh, earlier this year um, where we actually looked at the connectivity between high seas areas and coastal waters, in this case in the Indian Ocean. And you can see here from the colours um, represented on this chart that uh, the high seas and coastal waters are connected over time scales of a couple of weeks to a, a few months. So, Clearly, the high seas are important, but are they under threat? And the simple answer to that is yes. One of the prime targets uh, for deep water fisheries are seamounts. And the reason they go out and fish these seamounts is because there are aggregations of uh, fish, some of them very commercially valuable, around the seamounts. This is an orange ruffy. They live for about 150 years. So these fish are very slow growing. They don't mature till they're 30 or 40 years old. So they're very, very vulnerable to overfishing. And in fact, if you look at many of the other species that are caught in these fisheries, they are also very long lived. Things like the cardinal fish there above the orange ruffy live to about 70 years old. Um, so this is a major sustainability issue in itself. Of course, with fishing comes losses of fishing gear, which, as you can imagine, 
if you're trying to trawl across a, a mountain or set a net, there's quite a high chance of losing it. And this is a photograph of a, or a film of a ghost net on one of our sea mounts in the Southern Indian Ocean. And you can see that lobster there is completely tangled up in that, uh, in that line and uh, basically it's dying. So this net will just carry on fishing. Uh, a real surprise was this. These are lobster pots tangled up again on Melville Bank Seamount. This is the same seamount you saw the wreckfish and so on on. And this was a real surprise because this seamount was many hundreds if not thousands of miles from the nearest land. The other problem with this type of fishing is that because the fish die for the seabed, you have to catch them using bottom trawling. And of course, when you drag a trawl through a fragile deep water coral reef, it completely obliterates the coral. So here you can see uh, photographs from a fish seamount south of Tasmania and a seamount that hasn't been fished for orange ruffian oreos. And you'll see that the coral framework on the fish seamount is pretty much completely obliterated. And in fact, what we've discovered uh, more recently is some of these corals are very, very long lived. Uh, black corals, for example, can live to more than 4,000 years old. Some of the sponges can live even longer. And there's good evidence that a sponge from the South China Sea can live for up to 11,000 years. So it's probably one of the longest lived organisms on Earth. Of course, with fishing comes all sorts of other trash. And these are just a couple of bits we photographed on uh, the Southwest Indian Ridge. But the really hideous story here came from the actual sediments you see here surrounding these objects. What we actually found was that the sediments were completely full of microplastics. Every single sample we took down to a depth of 1.5 kilometers was contaminated with plastic. Even all the animals had plastic on them or actually inside them. And um, we actually looked at this in some detail. So we looked at the uh, uh, composition of the trash, if you like, in different parts of the deep ocean. And what you find is around the Southwest Indian Ridge, most of the trash comes from fishing. Elsewhere, it comes from shipping and from the land and so on. And this has become a real uh, problem. There's now something like five to 15 million tons of plastic uh, pollution going into the ocean every single year and along with that a large quantity of microfibers as well um, and it's estimated that if things carry on as they are we'll see an order of magnitude increase in this quantity of plastic going into the oceans by i think it's 2035. there are also uh, other pollutants still affecting the high seas legacy contaminants like pcbs which is a type of uh, uh, flame retardant used in electronics and so on. But there's a whole range of emerging pollutants which are now being found to affect the ocean as well. And this is everything from uh, chemicals in personal care products like shower gels um, to pharmaceuticals, plastics and so on. On top of that, of course, we've also got the effects of climate change. So we're seeing rising temperatures. The ocean has absorbed something like 93% of the excess heat uh, produced as a result of global warming. Uh, there's also ocean acidification and ocean deoxygenation as well. Um, and what are these things causing? Well, uh, the heating of the ocean is causing a complete redistribution of the biota. So organisms are moving further north or further south away from uh, higher temperatures. Animals are also getting smaller as well as a result of warming of the ocean. So in terms of fisheries, this is potentially quite a catastrophic situation because the fish stocks are moving away from low latitudes, basically from uh, developing countries, and they're moving towards developed countries and uh, they're becoming less productive as well. So this is an issue in terms of food security. Ocean acidification is caused by absorption of CO2 into the ocean, which is converted to carbonic acid, and this reduces the amount of calcium carbonate in seawater. And this, of course, affects the secretion 
of calcium carbonate skeletons or shells. And you can see an example here of a pelagic uh, snail. It's called a pteropod or a sea butterfly. Um, and this is a picture of uh, one of the shells of these snails that was sampled from an upwelling area in the Antarctic. And you can see where the shell is actually corroding as a result of this acidification effect on top of a naturally low pH water. And finally, the effect that almost everyone forgets about ocean hypoxia, where the warming of the ocean is causing a lowering of mixing, and that is causing a reduction of oxygen in the ocean expansion of what we call the oxygen minimum zone. And this effect has been estimated to have decreased habitat for billfish and tuna in the uh, tropical northeast Atlantic by about 15% um, between 1916 and 2010. As if that wasn't uh, bad enough, we're now seeing new industrial activities starting up in the deep ocean. And one of them is deep sea mining. Uh, this is a piece of one of those hydrothermal vent chimneys from the Southern Ocean, and you can see that it's almost solid copper. So these hydrothermal vent fields have rich mineral resources associated with them, but they're not the only mineral resources in the high seas. There are also cobalt crusts on sea mounts and manganese nodules, these uh, uh, mineral aggregations on the seafloor in places like the clarion clipton fracture zone uh, in the tropical Pacific. And uh, this map, which Gwilym uh, very generously put together for me, um, shows where an organization called the International Seabed Authority has licensed countries in areas beyond na national jurisdiction to explore for minerals in the deep ocean. And you'll see that big orange blob in the Pacific there. That's the clarion clipton fracture zone. And the licenses for exploration there cover the same area as the 20 largest countries in Europe. So all this is quite bad news, um, but there are things we can do about this. And one of those things is actually protect areas of the ocean using marine protected areas. Um, this is very good for protection from uh, extraction in terms of uh, fishing. Uh, it also eliminates the uh, side effects of fishing, things like seabed impacts. Um, you also preserve the population structure of uh, uh, species and also ecosystems, really, and preserve those structuring organisms in the ocean, like coral reefs and so on, which provide habitats for other organisms. Also, these MPAs actually may benefit in terms of um, actually uh, pushing back against some of the effects of uh, climate change. So there is a concept called blue carbon, where some of the activities in the ocean actually sequester CO2 into the deep ocean and lock it up from the uh, atmosphere. So um, we recently uh, put together a, a first concept of what a network of marine protected areas might look like in the high seas. And scientific studies have suggested that an optimal area of protection for the ocean is probably around 30%. And that's because below that figure, you're basically not giving uh, sufficient protection to various features in the ocean. Above that figure, you're getting diminishing returns for that area of protection. Um, but having said that, even small MPAs can be uh, quite effective. So how do we actually do this? Well, we used what's called systematic conservation planning, um, where essentially we used a computer-assisted method of identifying where uh, these MPAs would, uh, would best be um, placed. And what this does is we specify an area of the ocean we uh, want to actually protect. We specify what features of the ocean we want to protect. So it might be seamounts. Uh, threatened species, certain oceanographic features, and so on. Um, and uh, we basically model where to put the protected areas to protect those features, but taking into account the economic impact 
of where those MPAs are actually situated. And in this case, we calculated that economic impact through uh, the uh, estimated cost to fisheries of placing those MPAs. And we used a tool called MarkSan to actually do this. So what types of features did we actually uh, plug into this um, uh, uh, software? Well, it was things like, obviously, the spatial distribution of fishing, um, existing protected areas, but then oceanographic parameters like primary productivity, the amount of food being produced in the ocean, places where you had very high or very low interannual variation in temperature, which were likely to be resilient to climate change, then biophysical parameters like sea mounts, biological parameters like distribution of threatened species, and also something about the biogeography, uh, or at least the biogeography as we know at the moment. And what you end up with here um, is very interesting because what we actually saw as a result of this exercise is essentially a network of protected areas which surround areas of usage for humankind. So instead of on land where you often have protected areas which are kind of isolated by large areas of human use, this approach actually produced almost the opposite situation where you end up with networks of protection around islands of human usage in the ocean. And it was very interesting that uh, through the repeated runs of uh, this software, we had places which came up again and again and again in terms of needing protection uh, in the ocean. You'll see one of these happens to be right over the clarion Clipton uh, fracture zone, but there are various other uh, areas which came out as very important because of the combination of uh, conservation features that occurred in those parts of the ocean. So to summarize all that, the high seas are a very important part of the ocean and perform critical ecosystem services for humankind. Um, there is a very strong connectivity between the high seas and coastal waters. Uh, the high seas comprise a very diverse range of ecosystems, some of which have a high diversity, and there are threats which are degrading uh, these ecosystems um, at present and those are only going to get worse in the future unless something is done. And the 30 by 30 report was the first systematic attempt to really try and plan for spatial conservation of this entire uh, high seas area. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Gwilym to talk about how such areas could be enforced. Great, thank you very much, Alex. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna sort of focus in on a, a perhaps a, a narrow question here of, of how we might uh, monitor and enforce these, these areas which Alex has described. Um, in particular, I'm gonna focus in on, on sort of some of the technical aspects of, of different technologies which are being used to do this. Um, so here I'm looking at a, a figure from the Pew Charitable Trust which shows some of the technologies which are used to monitor the activities of vessels at sea. Uh, and these range from a variety of satellite te uh, technologies uh, to track vessels as well as image vessels, uh, as well as um, uh, sort of electronic monitoring, CCTV if you like, on board vessels, uh, drones, um, as well as um, uh, 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 sort of uh, ship-based drones if you like as well. And broadly, we can split these into two different uh, types of data. Uh, we have collaborative data and we have non-collaborative data. So collaborative uh, data or tools are things essentially where you have to have some sort of hardware on board a vessel uh, to, to have a sense of what that vessel is doing. Uh, and non-collaborative tools are things such as uh, your sort of satellite imaging or your drones where essentially you can monitor aspects of, of what vessels may be doing without having to engage directly with that vessel. If we talk about these sort of remote areas of the ocean such as uh, the ones that Alex highlighted, uh, it's, it's quite hard to imagine how you would monitor these without some sort of satellite technology. And I'm going to show you some examples from uh, the UK Blue Belt program, in particular from the Ascension Islands, where we've, we've done quite a lot of work, and how you might um, uh, monitor activities in relation to a protected area uh, such as this. So the UK Blue Belt program, for those that don't know, is, is a, is a um, 
an intent on the part of the UK government to, to designate 4 million square kilometres as MPA by 2020. And a lot of this is being focused in the UK overseas territories uh, where you find the bulk of uh, the biodiversity. So focusing in on uh, Ascension Island, so this is a, 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 an overseas territory in, in the southern Atlantic. Uh, it's a very small island, less than 100 square kilometres uh, in area, and has a very small population, less than 1,000 uh, people living there. Um, and for, for anybody that sort of wants to delve down into the details of what I'm saying, there's a the reference to the paper there, which is freely accessible uh, online. You can get into that. But <clears throat> in terms of where this, uh, uh, the Ascension Island is in relation to the fishery of the Atlantic, you'll see that it sits at the southwest, sort of, oh, sorry, southeast uh, corner of the sort of bulk of long line activity in the Atlantic. So it's a prime candidate for protection. Uh, and we were able to look at um, how you might monitor uh, this area for, uh, for designating an MPA. And this was moving, as I said, towards the, the UK government's sort of blue belt commitments to ascension. On the left-hand figure there, you'll see the sort of charted out the history of fishing in relation to ascension. So in, in blue, we've got periods where the Ascension Island EZ, that exclusive economic zone uh, around ascension, was a, was a licensed fishery. Um, where we had a lot of uh, fishing activity in and around Ascension. The red area uh, periods are, are times when the, the EZ was closed. And then we had a period where we were looking uh, uh, for the study where we had a sort of mixed management approach uh, where half of the exclusive economic zone was, was closed to fishery, a, 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 an MPA, no-take MPA, if you will, uh, and half of it was, was open. We had these two periods in 2016 and 2017 where we brought a lot of different satellite technologies to bear to understand the activities of, of vessels in and around Ascension, uh, as well as sort of looking at the economics of the fishery. And this is just to show that, that for one of those periods where the fishery was open, um, inside that, that sort of red circle, you can see that the colours in there show that the hotspots of fishing activity, uh, in particular up in the north uh, northwestern quadrant of the Ascension Island EZ. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to draw uh, for this next part on, on some data called automatic identification system data. So this is uh, it's one of those collaborative tools where essentially you have transponders on ships and you can use this to, to track the activities of fishing vessels uh, as they go about um, their business, essentially. But this was developed actually as, as a safety of life at sea tool um, using VHF radio to communicate between uh, ships uh, and uh, shore uh, to give a sense of the sort of course, direction, speed of different vessels. But these, these radio signals don't just go horizontally, they also go vertically. So an interesting study which put sensors up on the uh, International Space Station discovered that you can uh, detect these things in space and there are now constellations of satellites roving around the world uh, which detect these AIS signals. Uh, from which you can get sort of footprints, uh, breadcrumb trails, if you like, of vessel activity. Putting all of that together for Ascension Islands, so uh, that's what these sort of heat maps that you see for 2016 and 2017 uh, below there show. So we have uh, green low activity up to red high activity. And what you'll see uh, around the Ascension Island EZ, which is sort of that inner circle, if you like, uh, there's very little activity detecting on an AIS for this period. So this is a period where we had this managed fishery uh, and also this closed MPA. It's not just fishing vessels actually that we can detect uh, using AIS. Uh, we can also look at other aspects of the, of the sort of fishing industry. So uh, we can look at carrier vessels where fishing vessels might be offloading their catch. We can look at bunker vessels uh, where, which are vessels used to refuel uh, these fishing vessels to keep them active and fishing uh, sort of 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, and then we can also look at, interestingly, at fishing buoys, so markers that are used to mark gear, um, uh, long lines and so forth. One of the chief problems with AIS data is, is that it's, it's not obligatory for, for fishing vessels in particular to, to carry it. So a lot of vessels uh, will be what we would call dark vessels in that case. And, and this is a big problem. Potentially, you've got a large fleet operating in and around the area that you might want to protect, uh, which you just don't know what their activities are. 
So in this case, we look at another type of satellite data. This is something called synthetic aperture radar. And this is just basically like a radar that you might have on a ship, which scans the horizon and detects sort of big metal objects. Uh, you get a big return back. Uh, but in this case, operating from space, from satellite. Uh, and you can see that little image thumbnail there where you see uh, the presence of a, ve a vessel uh, against the backdrop of the ocean. So if we look at uh, detections and compare those now to our AIS uh, tracks, uh, we can see where these dark vessels are operating. And in the case of Ascension Island, actually, again, in, in response to these closures, they've moved outside of the EZ uh, and they're operating out on the high seas. So sort of putting that, that picture together, what we see is that we have dark vessels operating in close aff affiliation with a trackable fleet. Uh, and this does give us sort of uh, a reasonable confidence that an MPA in Ascension Island could be successful. In fact, it's not, not just us carrying out the study that, that are confident about that. So the UK government has now taken the, the bold step to, to basically put its money where its mouth is and back uh, an MPA in Ascension. Uh, the other interesting thing is, is the license uptake for that licensed fishery really was very low. So the economics of that sort of mixed management approach in Ascension just, just didn't really work. Uh, so they are supporting a, a full uh, no-take MPA in and around Ascension Islands. Moving to the sort of high seas context, so here we've got a different sort of data that I'm, I'm looking at. So this is something called Vessel Monitoring System. So this is a, a closed system. Um, essentially, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, you need to be within the system to get access to this data. But you can do interesting things with, with VMS data. So you can have two-way uh, communication between vessels and shore. Uh, and you can now set up things such as uh, what we call geofences or virtual fences. So potentially you can, uh, although if you go out on the ocean and drive around in your boat, you will not know when you drive across the EZ boundary or an MPA boundary. You could set up these virtual fences where, as a, as a boat driving around, you would, you would be alerted to the presence of an MPA. Um, and you can also send targeted information for different uh, gear types and so on. Um, and a recent study uh, by the Australian government using this approach reckoned that, that um, just in the trial, they saved uh, potentially four million Aussie dollars uh, just in potential uh, litigation costs through uh, improved compliance. The other thing that we see uh, that is sort of um, heartening, I guess, for the potential to, to have viable MPAs out in the high seas uh, is this, this concept of flick the switch. So this is something coming out of the, the Western and Central Pacific uh, Regional Fisheries Management Organization. And this allows coastal states to access the VMS uh, of their waters and for the adjacent high seas of, of other, other flag states um, operating there that are signatory to this agreement. So you can imagine a similar thing operating in a high seas context where essentially states give permission for their vessels uh, to be monitored in relation to these high seas closed areas. <clears throat> so just to sort of summarize really, my broad feeling really is that where there is a, a will um, there certainly are technical solutions to, to these problems of, 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 or this challenge of high seas marine protection. And certainly it's easier with, within these coastal state jurisdictions. But really the, the key points really to resolve are around international co cooperation and the institutions that will operate these. So the questions of who's responsible um, for the decisions on designation and how and by whom um, these MPAs will be monitored and enforced. Those are the sort of critical questions uh, in my mind to answer. And we've got an exciting study just to plug uh, being funded currently by the, the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation looking, looking at some of these uh, questions through the, the Oxford Martin School program. So at that end, I'm going to plug Alex's book since he uh, has added that onto my slides. Um, available in all good bookshops. Um, uh, and lots of witty tales, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, um, we've got time for questions. I just want to warn you, this is being uh, filmed and live webcast, so if you're not comfortable with that, 
save your question until afterwards and, and come grab one of these two. Um, but can I have any show of hands if there are any questions? Have this at the front, please. Um, so there's a lot of work at the moment that's going into looking at alternatives for plastic that could be made out of aquatic plants, uh, like seaweed. Um, do you anticipate this having ecological consequences that could rival those caused by plastic waste? Um, actually, the really critical thing when you're looking at these alternative um, uh, materials is that there's a full life cycle assessment done on whatever material it is. Um, and that means you look at, for example, the CO2 footprint of the material, you look at the consequences if it's a biological material, you look at what may be necessary in terms of cultivating uh, the plant or algal material for uh, that particular substance, whatever it is, and you look at the um, uh, almost uh, food miles, if you like, in terms of transport of the raw material to where it has to be processed and so on as well. And in fact, some biomaterials that may be uh, uh, suitable to replace plastics have turned out to not really come out that well from uh, those life cycle assessments. So um, you do have to really look at the whole you know, life cycle of those materials to understand what the impacts of those are going to be compared to, say, plastics like PET or whatever else it happens to be. There's another question. Um, both of you have mentioned the, uh, the impact on the marine environment of lost fishing trawler nets. Um, with modern transponder technologies, why don't we make it mandatory for all fishing nets to have transponders? So when they're lost, you can find them and recover them. That, that uh, would be a, a sensible thing to do. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this problem comes from illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. So probably by far the worst problem is gill nets, for example, and it is possible to buy container loads of cheap monofilament gill net and literally use it as a disposable asset in the ocean. Um, so there's a major problem with, with our, what we call IUU fishing and lost fishing gear, and you can't get those guys to basically obey the rules. But there are certainly other measures now being um, uh, used. So fishing gear is now being essentially labelled with uh, the name of the vessel where it's come from. Uh, there's mandatory reporting of gear loss in some fisheries. That's been trialled off Norway and has been found to be uh, quite successful. So people are waking up to the fact now that not only does this cause horrible suffering to the animals involved, but actually it causes a significant economic loss to the fisheries as well, because those fish that these ghost nets are catching uh, could be the fish that the fishing boats themselves are catching. So um, certainly in the better managed fisheries globally, they're, they're trying to solve that problem. Here's a question. Thank you very much, both of you, because it's really interesting. Uh, it's like having a, your own special Horizon program just presented for you, but <laughs> presented intelligently uh, instead of with the gloss of the BBC, and they're better than those. So. Yeah. But thanks, anyway. I'm intrigued, and I was frightened almost when uh, some months ago, was it, when the stories, what stories, the reporting of the finding microplastics in almost, almost everywhere you look, you think, oh, I suppose that's, yeah, it would, it would be, wouldn't it? Um, but I'm intrigued to know what we can say about how that's damaging the environment. You know, how small does microplastic become uh, an, uh, not actually damaging? Or, and how do we measure that? Uh, you, I can, I'm not saying there isn't a damage, I yeah. just don't understand how you would assess it. At, at those tiny little particles? Yeah. Well, um, that is kind of the, the million-dollar question at, at the moment that scientists are struggling with. What is the actual ecological consequences and the consequences ultimately for human health of all this material that's got into the food chain? Simple answer is, at the moment, we don't know. Um, what we do know is that certainly uh, microplastics and 
uh, nanoplastics, or even smaller bits of plastic, um, are uh, able to move from the digestive tract of fish into the tissues and even cross the blood-brain barrier. So there is certainly plastic getting into the food chain, and not only is it getting into the food chain, it's getting throughout the bodies of, of the organisms there. Um, we do know that uh, there is evidence in some organisms of inflammation associated with uh, microplastics in the body, and um, certainly uh, some of the chemical markers for stress as a result of those materials in the body, and that is suggestive of a problem. Um, most of the problem actually comes at a, a kind of more superficial biological level in that if you're, uh, say, a, a lugworm uh, on the beach or a bivalve mollusk feeding, um, you're taking up these microplastic particles and they're reducing the amount of actual food you're getting and potentially you're having to reject them from the body. And that has impacts on growth and reproduction uh, probably at the population level on those organisms. But the, the more difficult question is about toxicity. And that we, we don't understand, and that's going to need uh, a much more um, robust and sophisticated approach to, to try and address that problem. I mean, one thing I will say is there's no doubt we're eating microplastics, in my mind, when we're eating seafood. But the inputs of microplastics to us via seafood is probably only a fraction of what we're taking in from other sources. So what we're breathing in, um, what we're taking in through uh, water. So there's been microplastics found in drinking water in all sorts of places. Um, uh, what we're taking in through other forms of food as well. Um, and then it's a question of, OK, well, the stuff's getting into the body. Is it crossing into the tissues? And then uh, is it desorbing in terms of the chemicals? It either contains when it's manufactured or it's absorbed because obviously uh, plastics, being a, a non-polar uh, material, soak up a lot of um, organic pollutants as well. So it's whether those uh, chemicals actually desorb into uh, the body after they've been taken up. Um, but as I said, I think seafood is probably a relatively minor source, for humans anyway. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit more about the governance of the high seas. And so who's now looking at this 30 by 30 proposal for MPAs and how many nations are around the table considering it? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, it's no coincidence we did the 30 by 30 report at the moment. There is currently, well, the ocean, the high seas kind of governed through something called the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. And there is currently negotiations between all the signatory governments, and I can't remember how many that is, but it's a lot, and certainly all the big ones, um, uh, about um, uh, developing a new implementing agreement for the UN Convention on Law of the Seas, specifically to protect biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, and that's really important because at the moment, there is no legal framework to place marine protected areas in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, some of the fisheries management bodies have put protected areas out there, uh, specifically to protect from the effects of fishing. Um, but in, uh, it's quite easy for another state to just ignore those rules and go and do whatever they want to do in those uh, protected areas. So these are really, really important negotiations. They're going on at the moment uh, at the UN in New York. Um, we're all hoping for a strong agreement. Obviously, there are certain states with a different point of view who want a kind of weak agreement, which is likely to result in pretty much the status quo in terms of the way things are, are run at the moment. So. I was also wondering with the 30 by 30 MPAs, um, you said one of the parameters, well, one of the main ones is biodiversity. And for a lot of these regions, as you said at the beginning, they're incredibly difficult to measure that. 
Yeah. So how do you account for that in the planning? Because it's a crucial parameter, but... Yeah. Well, it, in this case, what we picked on was specifically threatened uh, species. Um, uh, they, I mean, we do have biodiversity information, so the data I showed you early in the talk showing where our species records are, are um, distributed in the ocean, that all comes from a system called the Ocean Biogeographic Information System. The problem is that the sampling is massively uneven across the ocean. So you have to kind of pick on some form of, um, you know, pseudo marker, I guess, for, for biodiversity. In our case, that was um, certainly threatened species, and I think also commercial species as well. Uh, so that's the kind of way we fudge that question. I won't say fudge because it was the best that we could do given the information that's available. Um, but we do, we are getting a better understanding of how biodiversity is distributed uh, in the ocean, certainly in coastal. <coughs> Uh, sees anyway. So. Okay. If, uh, oh, there is one more question over there. Um, you had uh, very briefly actually uh, addressed the point of microplastics, uh, which was also al already the subject of some questions. No? And uh, it seemed though, uh, that this was in very remote places. Uh, can, can you comment on uh, exactly in what places you made these observations and what is your opinion uh, where what is the what the major source of these plastics was probably not fishing gear no, no um 80 percent of plastics in the ocean are from land-based sources uh, so only 20 percent are coming from shipping fishing and other activities at sea a good deal of that is coming down rivers um top five countries in terms of sources are all in southeast asia so it's China, Thailand, um, Indonesia, uh, basically countries within that region, probably account for about 50% of the plastics going into the, uh, into the ocean. Um, once the material is in the ocean, of course, it moves away from uh, the coastline. Some of it gets washed up, but some of it moves out into the ocean and it's broken up and fractured into these um, microplastic particles and they end up being concentrated in the ocean gyres. So these are the large areas of circular circulation out in the middle of the ocean, the most famous of which is the, uh, called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, um, which is a rather dramatic name for an area where there's just a higher density of this material than other areas around it. Um, but then the material kind of goes missing. And we think that those missing fractions are either being essentially dissolved through biological and mechanical and chemical action, or it's sinking into the deep ocean. Um, so that's um, plastics with a, a size fraction of below a millimetre. Um, we know that these plastics get colonised by their own unique microbial uh, film. Um, that microbial film may actually be active in terms of breaking the material up. It's also active in terms of moving some very nasty pathogens around the ocean as well, things like vibrios. Um, so we've got a, a good general idea of where this stuff is going up to a point, but there are many, many questions still to be answered about um, wh where that plastic is actually going. You know, is it just ending up as smaller and smaller pieces, nanoplastics? We haven't really got an effective way of even measuring nanoplastics in the environment at the moment. So. OK, we have one more question over here. But I, I'm going to just ask a question, if I may, um, as the microphone lead goes across. This is organized as part of the City Council's Green Week, which is designed to inspire action um, among people in Oxford. So I just wonder if there were a couple of things that You've talked about fishing, you've talked about plastics, that, it, that we could do in our daily lives. To do, is there anything, and what would you recommend? Yeah, there's, there's a lot. I mean, we can certainly reduce our CO2 footprint. A uh, very good way of doing that is to eat less meat. So apologies to any butchers in the room um, uh, or other people that sell meat, but it's a simple fact of the matter. If you eat less, particularly red meat, 
uh, you are reducing your CO2 footprint. Uh, get on your bike instead of using your car, uh, something I try and do, uh, and Willem, in fact, as we both live out to uh, the west of the city. Um, uh, think about food miles as well, where your food's actually coming from, uh, and all the usual things about switching off the lights, getting your power from a renewable energy supplier. On fish, there's some fantastic uh, websites um, which can help you if you decide you're going to eat fish. It can help you to actually pick um, sustainable fish to eat. So the Marine Conservation Society of the UK do a very good guide to sustainable fish. WWF do guides, I think, for several countries around the world. Um, and if you're in the States, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute also do a very good guide for there. And of course, try not to use single-use plastics because that is turning into a real... Well, it's actually turning into a planetary boundary uh, problem. Yeah, so, I mean, there's also think of you've got the Marine Stewardship Council who, who certify yeah. a lot of fisheries. So a lot of supermarkets, you'll see those little blue labels on fisheries products, which give a, a certain expectation of, of standards of the operations of that fishery. Um, the other thing, sort of seeing uh, just this week within the Oxford Waitrose store, I think it was, where they're, they're sort of pushing the, the sort of zero packaging around food. So, I mean, potentially encouraging supermarkets to move that way so there's just less yeah. plastic in the supply chain, I think, is a, is a big step forward. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So there's a question here. Uh, thank you both. It was really, really interesting. Um, I was particularly surprised about the formula um, to design MPAs to detect MPAs and uh, the open ocean. You mentioned that uh, it takes into account um, just the economical impact it would have. And I noticed one of the areas highlighted was the NAFO area, northeast uh, Atlantic, uh, which has which is a major fishing ground, especially for trolling. And uh, could you elaborate a little bit how the economical impact is taken into account, how it is weighed? Yeah, I mean, the uh, impact is literally based on the amount of fish being caught in those regions. So it's the economic impact of uh, fish catches uh, in each polygon, more or less. Um, uh, and the NAFO area is one which has been massively, heavily overfished. Uh, as you know, I mean, it was the area where there was the great cod collapse uh, off Canada and all sorts of shenanigans going on in terms of IUU fishing, what we call high grading as well, where fishing boats were catching fish, keeping big ones and throwing back the small ones uh, so they could get all their quota in terms of large fish. So there, had been, there was a lot of activity there which really wasn't very helpful. Um, in terms of those fisheries. Um, the other thing about that location is uh, there are a lot of what we call vulnerable marine ecosystems there. So sponge grounds, cold water coral grounds, um, uh, so a lot of fragile habitat and also it's quite a rich area in terms of cetaceans and so on as well. So uh, that's why it was popping up in terms of an area of conservation importance. It's also an area where you've got a boundary between cold and warm water. Those tend to be very productive areas, and again, those were favoured in terms of our uh, particular approach to, to this study. Yeah. So it'll, it'll, that algorithm, if I understand it, is that applied, it, it, it tries to minimise the cost, but at some points, the biological benefit will be perceived as outweighing yeah. the cost. So you could still be supplanting a, a, an economically viable fishery. Yeah, but for perceived sort of good biodiversity gain, essentially, yeah. Okay, we're going to draw to a close there. And uh, I do want, just before um, we finish, to um, draw your attention to an event next week, which may be of interest. Um, same time, uh, 5 o'clock on Tuesday um, in this room, uh, we have Barbara Finnamore, who is the Senior Strategic Director for Asia of the Natural Resources Defence Council. She'll be speaking about whether China will save the planet under the title From Pollution to Solution. So uh, five o'clock uh, next Tuesday, and do keep an eye on our website for other upcoming talks. Um,
There is a drinks reception now to which you are all warmly invited. So as you leave, if you want a drink, go right. If you want to leave, go left. And perhaps we could just close by thanking our speakers one more time.